Hi. Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. I'm with Wikibon.org, one of the founders. And this is SiliconANGLE TV's continuous coverage of HP Discover. We're live on theCUBE with the Tinker Twins. So now, many of you might remember, we had Greg and Chris Tinker on uh, from an event that we did in LA. Uh, we Skyped them in, and these guys are basically, <laughs> you call yourselves smoke jumpers, problem solvers, right? I mean, you know a lot about a lot of different things. You're, you're two key members of uh, HP's Tiger team in the field. So first of all, welcome to the live cube. It's great to see you guys here. Thanks for having us, Dave. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah, so our pleasure. So uh, we're going to talk about cloud infrastructure, big data, maybe talk a little bit about Hadoop, uh, yeah, sure. how to make all this stuff work. Yeah, it's complicated out there for, for clients. So, um, Extraordinarily. Yeah, so, so Greg, why don't we start with you. Greg's in blue, folks. Um, you know, what are you seeing? What are customers you know, doing these days? Well, uh, the biggest thing I'm seeing today, Dave, is the fact that uh, as customers are growing their business, the big story of today is cloud convergence, whether it be public, yeah. private, and the customers are really having a big problem determining which course of action to go, whether they stay with traditional IT departments or they start moving into the cloud environment, whether it be moving test dev, QA, or they move their entire production line into the new cloud, private, public, name your favorite. We're making decisions on leveraging that uh, you know, legacy hardware, software. And in doing so, what the, they're taking advantage of, what we are in HP have been striving for is making sure that we provide customers with data protection, and I think that's a good segue into talking a little bit about data protection and how we can take that with cloud services or without and do traditional IT deployment, whether it be storage of 3PAR, P9500s, EVAs, our storage line goes up, you know, hundreds there, but all oh, right. But virtualization changes protection. your notion of data protection, right? And it how does. you can, yeah. it, it enables new things, but it brings new challenges, right? Talk uh, about new challenges, that. especially with data availability. Uh, the data availability, now you have thousands of VDIs a virtual desktop standing up on top of uh, terabytes or zettabytes of storage. Uh, so any kind of interruption of business could easily happen if, if anybody, uh, uh, essentially user administrators make a mistake. And how do we recover from those mistakes? Yeah, so you're saying, if some one person's laptop has a problem, well, that doesn't affect the entire organization, but there's a lot more at risk, you're saying, in yeah, this environment. Yeah, specifically, whether you're, whether you're in cloud or not, with converged infrastructure now, with the VMware, with the right. name your favorite uh, virtualization desktop structures, what we're seeing that customers do is they, as they merge all this data down into one hardware platform, the importance of a technology support partner, whether it be HP or other, is becoming a very critical component to the business and from the C-level executives, where five nines availability was the big thing years back, now mm -hmm. it's seven nines. <laughs> one minute or one second of downtime is practically unheard of, especially in these new converged infrastructures. If we have a mistake, whether it be human or hardware, the outage becomes a huge business impact. And I think that's a key segue into those business outages is sure. identifying the outage, identifying the actual root cause. That's one of the things we work on is identifying, when you take about, take, think of all this virtualization, where's the actual problem at? What the abstraction layers and identifying the, uh, whether it be a CPU level two detach, whether it be a context switch, whether you're, you're digging deep into the BIOS, IOCTLs, all the way up into the application layer. So right. I've been able to identify the virtualization layer, is it a virtualization problem? And of course, identifying whether or not the actual administrator made a mistake, or. So how does a, how does a customer deal with it? I mean, take, take a, 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 a security incident, for example, sure. in a virtualized environment, where you don't necessarily know physically what's connected to what, or, or do you? Well, that's <laughs> the key thing. You know, most customers, <laughs> though they say they do, most customers actually don't know their yeah. infrastructure uh, from soups to nuts. They, uh, you know, they, they think they all know everything is interconnects, but it, when it boils down to it, the ACLs that get involved with uh, all the security right. layers that are in the abstraction layers that are engaged mm -hmm. become a very complex nightmare to debug, especially when the business impact is so severe that um, you know wow. tension is high yep. uh, and customers want the business back online immediately. That's when the pressure becomes you know, very Simplistic intense. concepts, like, uh, for example, in Scully Stack, at these PGR locks. These are locks that were placed on LUNs. Simplistic to you two. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but when, when you look at these LUN locks, uh, this is actual data. The corporation's entire business data access, and all of a sudden, the host is no longer able to access the data. So now the application layer, the user environment, all mm. stalls. Yeah. Wow. And that, it's that, being that, able to identify that. Yeah, so, I mean, a simple problem if you know that's what right. you have. Well, right. and that's usually the phone rings and oh, my, I can't access my data. Well, the next question is where in the stack is that issue? 
And I think that's the key point to be made in the HP Technology Services branch. When a customer calls in, they tend not to know where that problem is. That's why they're calling in the yeah. first place. They have their own, you know, most customers all have their own IT support staff. And then they are calling because they need that assistance to figure out where that is, ask the right questions, right. to basically define the decision tree to basically tackle the problem at hand. So what are you guys seeing in cloud? Um, we just did a survey, we did a survey a year ago and, and basically nobody was doing hybrid cloud. And now today everybody's doing hybrid cloud. And I, yeah. I tweeted that out and some people were watching. And somebody said to me, well I just did an informal survey at my birds of a feather session and you know, a, a, a private cloud outranked public and hybrid by a wide margin. So what are you guys seeing? Is it still you know, it's private cloud? Are you, people moving to hybrids? It's hybrid, yeah. yeah. Hybrid clouds, yeah. yeah. I mean, a hybrid cloud leveraging uh, you know, third party uh, hardware, leveraging uh, legacy hardware, legacy you know, solutions that they've had on their production floor. But when it comes to private managed clouds, public clouds, it all depends on the business model. There are right. certain types mm -hmm. of engineering, certain type of uh, lab work that you just probably don't want to put in the public. Not yet, right. uh, because of the, the concerns regarding security. Yes, the security is there, but there's some concerns, valid concerns, that perhaps are preventing the public acquisition, but are great for managed clouds and of course, I foresee private. hybrid cloud, and my brother does as well. We see these uh, technologies every day from a customer client perspective when they call in. What do we see in real life is we see the hybrids. Um, very, very infrequently do one solution fit the entire portfolio of a given client. I yeah. would say that would be extraordinarily rare, unless it's a small mom and pop shop that is starting up. Mm -hmm. But your big mom and pop shops, those customers, it's always going to be a some type oh. of hybrid, probably yep. for years to come. Well, and the technology yeah. landscape is so varied, uh, and it's evolving extremely fast. And these customers are adapting it, and of course the technology experts they have on staff are having to learn those technologies. And it makes a lot of sense because the CapEx, the, already the money they have invested in the hardware, they can't roll all of it immediately but to meet right. the new technology at hand. So we're going to see the hybrid models for the next, uh, I'd say two to three years, easy. Yeah, well that's good confirmation because the, the numbers were stark. I mean, it was like single digits last year and now it's almost 40% are saying this is our primary strategy. And oh, then yeah. the, other, the other notable thing, and you guys know this because a couple years ago, the, the, the typical IT person was very skeptical about cloud, mm -hmm. right? They wouldn't yeah, even right. use the term, as we call yeah. it IT as a service, and now everybody's using cloud. Right. The number of people who say it's a buzzword of unclear meaning is really, really low now. Right. Well, now, it goes back to the concerns uh, years ago about shared services, mm -hmm. yeah. shared models. You know, it's the same concept. Now you have large corporations that have silos of data. Well, they got silos of servers. Different IT groups from different divisions of the corporation. Now they're able to leverage all those hardware, so they're able to put a private cloud or a public cloud. You don't want to do a public, they'll probably do a private cloud inside the corporation. And in some sense of the words, uh, cloud is the new buzzword. Uh, a yeah. lot of customers, uh, and I would say for several years in the past now, have already been using this methodology. They didn't call it the cloud, they didn't know that was what it was, was but that's basically what they were doing already from the start. Yeah. What we are now doing is we are, as an industry, putting a, basically a NASA wrapper around it, putting a standard model with it, Yep. And it's just standard servers are getting in incorporated into the model so it can easily be replicated right. and uh, growth can easily be achieved. Well, HP's creating this uh, you know, cloud uh, orchestration software yeah. that allows you to be able to deploy servers, image, image systems already. I mean, if you wanted Oracle or Sybase or in Informix on a Linux or Ubuntu or Red Hat or Windows, you're able to deploy these systems at a click. Click of a button. Where it used to take weeks to provision the storage, do the zoning and uh, network administration, create the ACLs, create the network act, act, uh, the route tables and, and all this infrastructure. Now it's a, it's a point and click. But yeah. there's still a lot of complexity underneath the covers, sure, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's what we do. And that's basically <laughs> where our job comes into play, and that's why we exist, actually, is because um, this complexity that you just spoke of, we do have, uh, you know, our engineering teams and our labs have spent a great number of years trying to reduce the simplicity, try to make it a simple screen that you can right. click and get what you're trying to a achieve. A nice dashboard and, and, and reports. Nice. Right, and so when those go wrong, and let's be honest, they will. Everything will go awry, it's all human <laughs> done, and so what we have to yep. do is we, will have to ha we have to be able to mitigate those risks, yep. isolate those problems, and fix them in a very yeah, timely fashion. Very fashion. Quickly, right. Right. It requires partnerships with support. Sure. Correct, yeah, and you know, it's not like HP is doing everything here, it's because we have a partnership agreement with a lot of different vendors, uh, Emulex, Geologic, the list goes on, and uh, we are working with and uh, diligently with, with them to sure. make sure that we can support these new uh, converged network adapters, you know, that people are hearing about and a little nervous. Some customers stick with the old methodology, single adapter for a certain task, 
and a lot of customers today in the last few months I've seen a lot of customers buying the new adapters uh, moving their entire infrastructure onto this single adapter 10 gigabit interface and they're really like really it. you know I, I hadn't expected to talk about that but um, the CNAs when I first saw them come out I said all right it may be take, take a while, but it's inevitable. It now. is. It's got to happen, because yeah. you're going to cut your connection yeah. cost in half. Connection cost, oh. infrastructure yeah. cost, yeah. power requirements. It's I'm a, a big no, fan it, of it. It's a no-brainer, yeah, really. We're big but, fans, yes. But, yes. But, but there's always that you know, inertia. Ah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> getting people off the and, log, right. getting them moving and forward. Then, and then the whole fiber channel over ethernet thing. Yeah. I mean, it goes back uh, to the administration. <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of advantages to it. Like uh, Chris and I are huge fans of boot from SAN. Personally, I don't think a server should have a disk inside it. But you know, there's there's pros and cons to both of those sure. strategies. But you know, Chris and I are big advocates. There's a whole why? lot. Why? Talk about why that is. What well, backups? Just, well, backups for one. But then another an great advantage if you just turn the server into a black box. Yes. It, if the server crashes or hardware has problems, you just replace the black box, boot it back up off the network. You're back off. Basically, running. it's a simple zone change at this point. You zone the storage to the new black box. Same architecture, you can't jump from a PA risk yeah. over to an ITAM, of course. Our yeah, but, it, constant. but it simplifies your environment, it mm -hmm. minimizes yeah. your risk, and, and it allows you to respond more quickly it, to exactly. all the things you were talking about. When you about. have a business risk, when a CPU mm -hmm. fails, when inevitably a hardware component does go awry, sure. um, it makes it far faster for customers to have that DR strategy and come right back online in a, in a blink of an eye for the most part. So, I want to shift topics and talk about big data. Okay, you know, big it's, data. It's hot right now. Yeah. So yes, it is. It's yes. kind of the new buzzword, you know, it's taking over for cloud. Um, but, it seems real in that companies are trying to figure out how they can get value out of data, sure. value All out right. of information, totally makes sense, right? Oh yeah, agree. Now, I'm intrigued, you guys, uh, you know, experts in uh, many, many different disciplines, and then this thing called Hadoop comes on. Sure, right, right. right. So you, don't tell me you're like born experts in Hadoop, right? You just, this, <laughs> right, right, so right. pig and hive and, and, <laughs> and, and scoop and all this crazy stuff. So what's happening out there with, with big data? Where does it fit in what you guys and HP are, are doing? Okay, so Chris and I are spending a great deal of time with uh, all types of analytics right now. You have Vertica, Hadoop, right. uh, Autonomy. And then uh, talking about Hadoop, you have those, those abstraction layers that sit on top, hive, pig, the other ones that you mentioned. Um, so we are catching up to speed with that on all of our engineering groups. We spend a great deal of time debugging those things. Yeah. And more than important than anything, I think the biggest problem we're seeing with customers is performance. At the end of the day, we're always partnering with those programmers, the guys who actually write the code for Hadoop, mm -hmm. and of course, Vertica and, and Autonomy. The issues that we see more often are performance. Yeah. Okay, so you're talking about uh, going out there and the business would like to analyze all this data and essentially extract meaningful data from it. Well, how do they do that? They have to go out there and scan terabytes of data. Sure. Well, how do you speed that up? How do you do that in efficient manners? You got to look at parallelization, you got to look at the CPU context, you got to look at network throughput saturations. That's, That's where we get engaged a lot of time is strictly on the performance basis of Absolutely. whether it be Hadoop or name your favorite out there, whether pulling the data in, having the plugins, ODBC calls, or et cetera, the plugins that will allow us to pull the data out of Oracle, uh, Sybase, and Formix, name right, your favorite. Right. Uh, structured data with uh, using Vertica um, or unstructured data as well. Well, it's just, just, just recently I took a case on a, a situation where you would always think having more RAM in a computer is a better thing. Mm. It's always more RAM is better, right? Well, we had a terabyte of RAM, and the situation was it was regarding how it was actually doing interleaving and the CPU context switches. I could not get the uh, performance up to the customer requirement. I started analyzing the uh, computer, analyzing the application. Hadoop, looking at how it was actually making the system calls, looking at where it was spending its time, and sure enough, I was able to ascertain it was in the memory. And we were able to essentially make some BIOS changes, re-architect the actual solution, and got over double the performance. So the beauty of Hadoop, of course, is you can bring five megabytes of code to you know, terabytes of data, and you Correct. don't have to bring all the data through the little teeny exactly. pipe, right? Sure, so that's exactly. great. But then now, I've got all this data out there distributed, <laughs> and I want to get to it. Right. So how are people actually you know, bringing the nuggets back in and analyzing it. That's a hard problem. It, it, it is, is a hard problem. Yeah, yeah and some is. customers are bringing it into a new database, like you right. know, uh, putting it on Exporting a it. Hadoop file system sure. uh, with a, or a Vertica. Um, and some customers will leave the data where it is and actually pull it in partials and do the, an the analytics there like mm -hmm. that. The biggest question of the day is when you have to pull all the data in. That's where we're seeing most of our customer complaints yeah. is when you have these Databases, and I can't give customer names, of course, but when you're talking about um, 100 terabytes, you're not going to do anything fast with 100 terabytes. <laughs> and that's the current problem we're running into is 
we have this massive amount of data. We have to yeah. analyze it and give real-time uh, results back to the executives yeah. within a few minutes. Using a batch make, system. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. In real time is the, you know, yeah. that's a catchphrase. They tend to say it's more, most often near time. Near time, uh, right. Because it's, you're usually a few minutes back. I like uh, uh, my colleague David Floyer said, my definition of real time is before you lose the customer. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's not good enough. <laughs> it is, yeah. I mean, you know, most customers that we're dealing with now are, are used to the traditional IT shops, uh, the, sure. big, the big day, uh, the HPCCs, the high performance computer Deep clusters. Yeah. yeah, when you're talking about latency in the na you know, nanoseconds to multiple milliseconds, now we're having to go up into the multiple seconds to analyze these big data pools um, customers start to lose tension, get aggravated, because they're not used to this new engine, if you will. Especially when you're talking about the amount of data that, uh, that's out there. And especially when they start pulling in all the tweet feeds and start doing analytics <laughs> on that. <laughs> well, late, so you mentioned latency, wasn't it? I think it was Goldman Sachs who said, it was a couple years ago, said that it, for every millisecond we can shave off of our you know, application performance, it's $100 million to the bottom line a year. That's a correct statement. And, and, and I think that, that's in the, uh, yeah, in the well, anything that's in the banks, the monetary basis, yeah, the, the high volume that, trading. Yeah, exactly. You know, I look at what I was working on, what, two weeks ago, and I was having to shave, I was in the microsecond range, and I needed to shave about 20 microseconds off of a process yeah. that was running for several hours. All right, yeah, that's a good, so. and a good analogy there, Chris, uh, is the fact that when, uh, when we say we're debugging the latest problems, uh, right. this is a new, um, I, and I can't get into a lot of particulars on it, but I'll say this yeah. is a bleeding edge technology that's out it there, is. Yeah. that uh, is being used by customers in ways that honestly was never perceived, and we were running into a particular problem where uh, we were spending time on a CPU thread at uh, 68 to 86 microseconds, and we needed to shave it down to 28. Yeah. So it's, uh, you know, that, yeah, those are the things we're working on. That's, you know, mm -hmm. uh, wow. Even with our technology background, we still partner with the actual, you guys who actually wrote the chip, spun the ASICs, all the way up right. to the, you know, the guys who actually write the kernel code, it does the actual scheduling of the CPU context. What's your, what are your, what's your backgrounds? Are you guys CS <laughs> guys, are you? <laughs> Mechanical and physics. Uh, yeah. So okay. our mathematics is our background, and uh, computer programming happened to be a hobby, and I think that's true for a lot of the Hadoop guys out there. <laughs> yeah, well the data scientists are this m interesting mashup, right? Yeah, right. Statisticians and, yeah. You know, programmers and, and, and data hackers, really. Uh, basically, oh, sure. it's, uh, most, most of us, I think, it became a passion. That, uh, oh, sure. We got into the companies, whether it be HP, Google, name your favorite, that um, you know, we actually just enjoy what we do and we're lucky to get to work for the companies. Yeah, well, it's interesting to me. You seem technology agnostic. It really, te the technology doesn't matter. You're gonna, it's going to come, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go. Yes. It's, it's your perspectives and then how to deal with it, from a, certainly from a process standpoint, and then how to make it work. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. and yeah. the technology is extremely agile, so it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it moves with the business. At the end of the day, the business, it, the IT is there to serve a function, it is there to serve the business. At, at the end of the day, what, we're, what our objective is in HP, and this is true for much any engineering branch, is we want to better the business strategy, so we know, we know that today's technology will probably be obsolete in 10 years, of course it will. 10 year technology ago was, is already gone, nobody talks about it anymore. I'm trying to think of the old bag phone. Anybody remember those? <laughs> 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 you know, thank God we're not there no more. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's, you know, me and Chris have always been very um, in, admired the technology growth and how we're trying oh, to right. keep up with it. It's a lot yeah. of fun. All right, Chris and Greg, thanks very much for coming on. Yeah, really appreciate lot, it. You guys are thank a you, unique Dave. pair and a real asset. Uh, for HP, uh, oh, congratulations you. on all your success and really appreciate you making time out to come in the queue. Oh, thank you for having us. All right, thank you everybody for watching. Keep it right there, we'll be right back. Uh, we've got a great CIO segment. Ernie Parks, the VP and CIO of 3M Corporation is coming on next. Keep it right there. First time on the cube, baby. Rock and roll. Well, I think it's probably five or six times I've been on the cube now. Right, and you know, at first, the guys are just fun to work with. Pat, welcome back. Hey, always a pleasure to be in the cube. Hey, I'm about to go on the cube. You never know what's going to happen. I'm, uh, a three-time veteran of being on the Cube. Uh, I hope many, many more. Chad Sackets, Chad, welcome to the Cube. Dave, John, it's great to be here, man. I keep coming back because uh, great, insightful questions from uh, from uh, John and from Dave. What face-melting action have you seen here at the event? And I know there's a lot of it. 
It's a great vehicle to uh, to communicate with a broad audience. A lot of folks watch. Great to have you back. Good job. All right, Craig Nunez, uh, VP of Marketing at HP Storage. Thanks very much for coming on the Cube. When people mention the Cube, they they're like, "Oh my God, I saw you on the Cube!" And they're all excited about it. It's it's a it's an experience. It's not just information. They experience kind of what's going on there. It's like real time. It's like they were there. That was like my going to the gym. Boom, boom, boom. Legendary IBMer, CEO of Symantec, and now CEO of Virtual Instrument. Uh, great to have you on the Cube. So for Cube to be here at a conference like this, that's got 15, 20,000 people, and sharing that live around the world, that's consistent with the way the, the world is evolving. So it's a wonderful medium, a wonderful medium. John and Dave are amazing. I don't know how they keep everything in their heads the way they do. Uh, it's a great format, and we're obviously seeing that this notion of real-time coverage and a real conversation is what's driving us as a company. And I, I said very seriously, when the questions and the comments that we hear from from them and from all the different guests here directly turn into the products that we build. Yeah, that was my first Cube and uh, I really enjoyed it. There was the oh, rapid fire of questions. It made me think on my feet, but they were very thought provoking and really got me going on analyzing the, the greatness of Arista and the greatness of the Cube as well. John and Dave, the reason their approach works, they're not just guys you know, reading down the questions.